helpful. I do think it's helpful. Okay, so if we're going to move from that and talk about the hierarchy here, the hierarchy, hierarchy in view is not that of Maslow. It is that of God and his just reign over the created order. And his just reign has been uh, not only uh, evidenced by himself in the way he relates the created order, he makes Adam and Eve, uh, commands them to have dominion over the earth, the dominion mandate, right? Be fruitful and multiply, fill and subdue the earth. Make the earth that I have created into a garden of Eden. Use your reason to, imp to bring about justice in this created world, which will grow. You know, the herbs will grow. The animals will flourish. And it's for you to bring culture into the garden. You're going to have to impose a sort of a cu the cultural mandate so that you're going to prune the trees and you're going to cut back the weeds and you're going to bring things to flourish even more fruitfully. It's a good creation. You're going to, in a sense, act like God in bringing about a, a culture, a human culture that will reflect God's own heart. Because God creates a, a, a he, he calls it good. He does it for a good motivation, not a selfish, pragmatic motivation. Okay, so how do, what happens in Macbeth then? Well, the witches prophesied at the beginning that Macbeth would be the Thane of Cawdor, Thane of Glamis, and then King. And also made certain um, prophecies about Banquo. Uh, but they appeared again at the behest of Hecate. Now I want you to, okay, I like what you've done, but you haven't included me, I'm very angry about this. Let me in on this. And it, it, so it gets more and more dark, the play. Now the full forces of evil are unleashed, and there's a sense that what's bad can get far worse. So in Act 3, we, we, if we know the play, we know that it's going to get resolved and so forth. But at, in Act 3, when Hecate comes in, there's a suggestion that can get even worse, there's, that the injustice will not stop. And maybe Macbeth cannot be stopped. He's going to destroy the whole kingdom. And he thinks that is the case, in fact, in his delusion. Because he thinks no man, he's heard that no man of woman born can defeat him. Well, that, what man has not been born of a woman? Even Jesus was born of a woman. So he's not afraid. He, and, and he thinks that he can use his power in an immoral fashion, just like he did at the beginning, and continue to benefit from it. Even though there'll be nothing left of the kingdom. He will have no opponents because he'll have killed them all. Okay, but then there, what's the point of having a kingdom? You'll have no subjects. Anyway, um, but in Act 5, the witch's prophecies are fulfilled. Firstly, Burnin Wood does move and attacks the castle. How is that even possible? The wood wouldn't move. Well, in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, it does, right? In the two towers, you see the forest of Fangorn, it's now moving, and in fulfillment of prophecy, and he's clearly got Macbeth in view here, but it moves forward. Secondly, we have uh, Macduff face off against Macbeth, and Macbeth saying he's a fool, that he cannot be defeated by any one woman born, and he says that he was untimely ripped from his mother, in other words, a C-section. I was not born. In Tolkien, he has a little twist on it because, uh, what's her name? Says that I'm not a man, I'm a woman. Roar and roar and Okay. Well, <laughs> we got boss girl coming out and it's gonna be the woman that is, you know, I, yes, but I'm not a man, I'm a woman. Well, yeah, but the man is using a generic sense so that it wouldn't really work for Tolkien, but okay. Works well in Hollywood and it's a funny line and she gets to roar and anyway. <laughs> but the same reversal of expectations. This is not possible. Oh, yes, it is, because there's a trick, there's a riddle here, and you haven't solved the riddle. So there's a point of, uh, in a classical tragic sense, anagnorisis, a recognition 
because when as soon as Macduff reveals to Macbeth that he uh, has been untimely ripped from his mother's womb, Macbeth realizes that he can be defeated and is about to be defeated. And uh, there, are, there are senses here, and he uses language here, and it's very interesting, uh, that Macbeth realizes that he is in the autumnal phase of his life. It's the, it, winter is coming. He's at the end of his reign, and he has become prematurely old. He hasn't actually aged in years, but he's aged in the sense of the, the uh, time or the duration of his monarchy is at its end. And so his life cycle is out of whack because he's still young in his years. He hasn't aged at all, and yet his reign is going to be very sh short, very brief, just like his wife's life was cut off short. And it becomes fruitless and meaningless. He can't enjoy the thing that he sees out of pragmatic considerations, right? Because he considered the material, he saw the crown as a material thing, not as a reflection of justice or order or love or all those things he set aside out of the base motivations, the lowest form of love. He didn't even have any heirs. His, his, he had no uh, progeny to pass the crown onto. It was a mad act by Macbeth, absolutely insane. And yet he did it nonetheless. And Shakespeare is very interested in teasing out the consequences of bad ideas. But he does it in terms, although Macbeth may go after the, the lower forms, he, uh, Shakespeare reorders it by appealing to Lewis's notion of love being the correct ordering principle of life. He strongly emphasizes that. How? By defeating Macbeth. And so the divine order is asserted and reinforced by the way the play plays out. And we've seen uh, various forms of madness. Last time in Act 5, Scene 1, we looked at Lady Macbeth going mad. And in Act 5, Scene 3, we had the discussion between Macbeth and the doctor, and Macbeth imploring the doctor to heal his wife, and the doctor saying, it's not within me to do this. And the doctor says, again, line 45, um, the patient must minister to himself. Act five. No, oh, have we already gone beyond into the quotes? Yes, we have. Footnotes. I don't want that. Scene seven, it'll be scene three. The queen is dead, there she go. Oh, this is scene five. Okay, I'll, I'll come to back to this. Um, she says, uh, can you not cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart? The doctor's response there and the patient must minister to himself. Can't you deal with the problem of human nature, Macbeth is arguing by dealing with biochemical things. Can't you solve it through chemistry? Can't you give her a pill? Can't you purge her of the problem? The doctor's response is no, because the problem is the, of the, the spiritual nature. I, no doctor, no physic can help this. It's a spiritual uh, problem, and a spiritual remedy must be sought. So Macbeth, your view of life is totally disordered. And what does Macbeth say? Throw physic to the dogs. I'll none of it. Come put mine armor on, give me my staff. So he just, the heck with the doctors. I'm going to go out and I'm, I can't do anything about Lady Macbeth. I'm going to go out in battle and have a physical conflict as if it were ever only as physical engagement as if there weren't spiritual matters involved in the entire affair. He's going to act in a mindless fashion like a great oaf 
which is what he is at this point. He's a man of violence. Okay, Shakespeare's not opposed to that per se, but he's a man of violence without any morality. He's, he's thrown away his moral nature, acted as if it didn't exist, and now acts as if battles were won solely on the basis of physical strength. And he's not worried about that. Let's carry on. So he has, he has cut off his own head and he's hollowed out his own chest with the exception of one virtue, which is that of courage, which is now most uh, powerfully expressed indeed. He's a very courageous man. He fears nothing. So scene four, the drums and the colors of the battle scene um, and the discussion. Let me come to act five, however, because it is, I think I talked about it last time, but I want to come back to it here. Satan says to Macbeth, uh, the queen is dead. The queen, my lord, is dead. Macbeth, she should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. He doesn't even have time to mourn his wife now while he's in battle. But also, it's of no moment, in a sense. It's irrelevant, because life is meaningless. He's imagining a future in which things like acts of devotion, acts of moral reverence would be meaningful. And at the moment, it's just material need that is preeminent. It expresses his worldview to the utmost, this speech. She, would have she should have died there hereafter, and then she would have had a time for such a word. Then there would have been time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. And now in reference to her, his wife, because remember she always insisted and walked around with a candle because she was afraid of the dark. And the dark had a, I, I submitted to you, a spiritual and a theological reference. And so she's afraid of a world which she denied was true at the outset, namely that, that she is a moral being and we live in a moral world and there are consequences for that. She denied that it was even valid and then having committed the heinous act, can't, is afraid of the dark like a small child. So here, out, out, brief candle, a reference to his wife, but also to life in general. It's more, I think, more of a, an existential statement than, than this. And, and it reflects Macbeth's own view of the world at this point. This is how bad it, he's become. Out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. And then a messenger comes in and he says, thou comes to use thy tongue, thy story quickly. Okay, but this idea that there is no meaning to life. It's a human life lived well or lived badly when it ceases to exist means nothing. We'll have, this is not the end of Macbeth here. He will move a little further even and ex explain that language itself is even meaningless. His words say that life means nothing. He will find that there's no signification to words even. It becomes a total man of action. like an animal. Animals also don't speak. People, when they're about to get into a fight, they usually flight before they fight. When I say flight, I mean it in the sort of Anglo-Saxon sense of you, you trash talk first. Trash talking works, by the way. It, it, it intimidates the person you're going to fight and they think they can't win and so then you, you don't have to fight because they cower and, uh, and submit before the physical combat even begins. If that doesn't work, it helps you because you've degraded the person 
with your words and now it's easier for you to treat them as if they're not a human being and you can just pulverize them. So it has an effect on its audience. It also has an effect on the person that uses us. Christians shouldn't trash talk because it demeans the person that bears the image of God. And it put, puts you in the satanic position of treating a human being like a, a means to an end. All the same, this is what happens. And in the end, he's going to renounce his words. But what happens next? What does the messenger say? Gracious, my Lord, I should report that which I say I saw, but know not how to do it. Well, say, sir, as I did watch, upon the hill I looked toward Burnan, and anon methought the wood began to move. Liar and slave, let me endure your wrath if it be not so. Within this three mile may you see it coming. I say a moving grove. If thou speaks false upon the next tree shall thou hang alive till famine cling thee. If thy speech be sooth, I care not if thou dost for me as much. I pull in resolution and begin to doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. Fear not till Burnin Wood do come to Dunsinane. And now a wood comes towards Dunsinane. Arm, arm, and out. If this which he avouches does appear, there is not flying. There is nor flying hence, nor tarrying here. I begin to be a weary of the sun, and wish the estate of the world were now undone. Ring the alarm bell, blow wind, come rock, at least we'll die with harness on our back. And out he goes. But he, he's, uh, there's a premonition now. If this is true, he doesn't want to live. And wishes that the whole world would dissolve all of its meaning and significance. And he now wishes there, that, that the, not only the crown, but the whole world no longer was. And there's a very rapid shift from scene to scene at this point, reflecting uh, the battle in which they're embroiled at this point and, this, and the activeness on the stage. And if you ever watch it being portrayed, there's a very s a rapid s shift from scene to scene a little bit confusing because you don't know the lesser characters nearly as well. So here we can say, okay, we've got Malcolm and Seward speaking, but are you, when you're watching Macbeth, it, I've forgotten who those guys are. <laughs> they come on stage, but you know that they're against uh, Macbeth, so that's sufficient here. But Malcolm is the, is the king from the south who's coming. Now this, this is part of the restoration of order. Here's a a godly king in some sense, or rep representing a legitimate order, coming in to restore legitimate order in Scotland. Very important. It, it, we'll see the same thing in Hamlet. The king will come from overseas and will restore order. Just order, it's not just defeating the man in battle by a stronger man, it's a just legitimate form of uh, defeat in battle. Anyway, Malcolm, now near enough, you're Levy screens throw down and show like those you are. You, worthy uncle, shall with my cousin, your right noble son, lead our first battle. Worthy Macduff and we shall take upon us what else remains to do, according to our order. Very well. Do we but find the tyrant's power tonight? Let us be beaten if we cannot fight. Macduff, make all our trumpets speak. Give them all breath, those clamorous harbingers of blood and death. Enter Macduff, or Macbeth rather, in the next scene, and then Macbuff, Macduff is coming in. So scene seven is pivotal scene, another part of the field. Enter Macbeth. They have tied me to a stake. I cannot fly, but bear like I must fight the course. What's he that was not born of woman? Such a one am I to fear or none. Enter young Seward. We've just met his father, young Seward, to Macbeth. What is thy name? Thou'lt be afraid to hear it. No, though thou callst thyself a hotter name than any in, is in hell, 
My name is Macbeth. The devil himself could not pronounce a title more hateful to mine ear. No, nor more fearful. Thou liest, abhorred tyrant. With my sword I'll prove the lie thou speaks. And of course, Seward is slain. Macbeth, thou was born of woman, but swords I smile at, weapons laugh to scorn, brandished by man that's of a woman born. Enter Macduff. Macduff, that way the noise is. Tyrant, show thy face. If thou beest slain and with no stroke of mine, my wife and children's ghost will haunt me still. I cannot strike at wretched kerns whose arms are hired to bear their staves. Either thou, Macbeth, or else my sword, <coughs> with an unbattered edge I sheath again undeeded. There thou shouldst be, by this great clatter, one of greatest note, seems bruited. Let me find him, fortune, and more I beg not. This way, and now Malcolm and Seward come in, so we, we get the heroic Macduff bent on meeting his foe in battle, desperate to do so for virtuous reasons. Act 8, or scene 8. Now gets the great showdown. Enter Macbeth. <coughs> Note how his lines have lost their meter. The de degeneration of the king has resulted in a loss of the formal kingly properties of his, his it reflects a disordered soul, a disordered mind. Shakespeare does this all the time. When you have kingly characters, note their language. When you have common characters, note their language. When it starts to fit in orderly, it's a reflection of the virtue of the character or lack thereof. Macbeth, why should I play the Roman fool and die on mine own sword? Whilst I see lives, the gashes do better upon them. Macduff comes in, turn, hellhound, turn. Of all men else I have avoided thee, but get thee back. My soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. Macduff, I, I have no words. My voice is in my sort, thou bloodier villain than terms can give thee out. Fight, alarm. Thou losest labor, says Macbeth, as easy mayest thou the entrenchant air with thy keen sword impress as make me bleed. Let, thy, but let fall thy blade on vulnerable crests. I bear a charmed life, which must not yield to one of woman born. <coughs> Despair thy charm, and let the angel whom thou still served tell thee Macduff was from his, woman, his mother's womb untimely ripped. Oh my goodness, bad place to have us. Accursed be that tongue that tells me so, for it hath cowed my better part of man. And be these juggling fiends no more believed and palter with us in a double sense that keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope, I'll not fight with thee. So he now wants to retreat. Just simply at the words. I'm not of woman born. Suddenly all of his courage is gone. Macduff, then yield thee, coward, and live to be the show and gaze of the time. We'll have thee, as our rarer monsters are, painted upon a pole and under it, here may you see the tyrant. When he hears this, I will not yield. To kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet? He wants to die. He doesn't want to be displayed as a living sign of rebellion and treachery and tyranny. I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm and, and justice and legitimacy. I will not do that because young Malcolm represents all of these things. He hates these very things. It's, so when he struck his kinsman down, he struck 
the image of God down. That's what he, it was actually rebellion against God. That's what's being displayed in this speech. And Malcolm represents that. He hates the very idea of justice. That's how degenerate he's become. I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet and to be baited with the rabble's curse. Though Burnin would be come to Dunsinane, and thou opposed, being of no woman born, yet I will try the last. Before my body I throw my warlike shield, lay on Macduff, and damned be him that first cries, hold, enough. Enter fighting, and Macbeth slain, and Macbeth, Macduff carries off his body. Very important uh, exchange here. Uh, Re Macbeth renounces language in the end, renounces it utterly, renounces justice, the meaning of life, etc. He will rather die. He doesn't want any signification to his life, just as he thought that his own wife, Lady Macbeth, died without any meaning or significance. He likewise will not signify anything. He doesn't want to signify. It's expression of nihilism of sorts. Going to revert to action without words. Same state as at the beginning of the play, by the way. Very interesting. Fair is foul and foul is fair. But we're going to find that in the return of Malcolm, uh, fairness is now fair again, and it's not foul. So order is restored, virtue, justice, etc. So scene nine. at least in my book, here it uh, has it in this edition as a continuation of that. Okay. Malcolm, I would the friends we miss were safe arrived. Seward, some must go off, and yet by these I see so great a day as this is cheaply bought. Macduff is missing, and your noble son. Your son, my lord, has paid a soldier's debt. He only lived, but still he was a man. The witch no sooner had his prowess confirmed in the unshrinking station where he fought, but like a man he died. Then he is dead? Aye, and brought off the field. Your cause of sorrow must not be measured by his worth, for then it hath no end. So Ross praises the young dead Seward for being a great man, dying for honor. Had he his hurts before? I, on the front. Why then, God's soldier, be he, says the father. Had I as many sons as I have hairs, I would not wish them to a fairer death. And so his knell is knolled. He's worth more sorrow, and that I'll spend for him, says Malcolm. He's worth no more. They say he parted well and paid his score, and so God be with him. Here comes newer comfort. So now, the young Seward represents all of the virtues that Macbeth represented at the beginning of the play, when he was honored by the king. But here he's fallen in battle. Nonetheless, he died honorably. So honor is being honored by the king. Unlike when Macbeth ruled, when dishonorable acts were being legitimized and criminals were becoming the companions of the king. Now we have a true king rewarding virtue and honor. So a restoration has happened. The, the tyrant is dead, and now the restoration is ensuing. Enter Macduff with Macbeth's head. Hail, king. Hail, king, for so thou art. Behold, there stands where stands the usurper's cursed head. The time is free. I see thee compassed with thy kingdom's pearl, that speak my salutation in their minds, whose voices I desire aloud with mine. Hail, King of Scotland, and all. Hail, King of Scotland, and then a flourish of trumpets. Malcolm concludes the play, very tight ending. <clears throat> we shall not spend a large expense of time before we reckon with your several loves, your loves rightly ordered. We will pay you measure for measure as you've acted rightly. We shall not 
spend a large expense of time, and make us even with you. We give you what you deserve. My thanes and kinsmen, henceforth be earls, the first that ever Scotland in such an honor named. What's more to do, which would be planted newly with the time, is calling home our exiled friends abroad that fled the snares of watchful tyranny, producing forth the cruel ministers of this dead butcher and his fiend-like queen, who, as tis thought, by self and violent hands took off her life. This and what needful else that calls upon us by the grace of grace, we will perform in measure, time, and place. So thanks to all at once and to each one whom we invite to see us crowned at Scone. With the stone, the stone of Scone, where, where Scottish kings are crowned. So it concludes with no rhyming couplets. So not only do we have rhyme, but we have rhyming couplets. Only at the end, order, harmony, symmetry, proportion, justice meted out, those that deserve to get it. So very, very tight orderly ending to a play that began in disorder where fair was foul and foul is fair, where fair is now fair and foul is gone. It's a tragedy nonetheless, because Macbeth is a great man who chose the wrong path. And so, and, and the, it, it attains a tragedy by getting a sense that this was a great man. Macbeth was a great man, nonetheless, who fell. So be warned, those of you watching this, that you not undo your own nature in the, uh, in the belief, the vain belief, that you can get to the top of the pyramid by going low. That's the demonic logic of Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. That's, it's a demonic logic. It's a, it's a non-hierarchy. It denies spiritual realities, which are most central to human nature, as even his chart or his little image displays. Any comments or questions before I conclude with this? And we'll take a break, and then we'll move on to King Lear. No? Good for now? OK. <clears throat> well, let's take